you may recall that on in one of the last episodes we had talked about the historiography of nationalism in which we had tried to suggest that during the 1920s the national movement had started undergoing a qualitative transformation historians have agreement on this issue that the rise of gandhi and the development of the congress as a mass organization the gradual integration of the peasantry into the mainstream nationalism the way the bridges were built between urban politics mainly the politics of the intelligentsia public spirited nationalist intelligentsia and the peasantry all these were solid achievements of the early part of the 20th century especially after gandhi's rise in indian politics managed to bring in the submerged regions of india within the nationalist mainstream new regions actually began to produce new generation of leaders and these new generation of leaders became the general staff of gandhi's army historians have certainly disagreement about the motivations about the implications of this mobilization but there is no questioning the fact that gandhian mobilization brought about a very significant transformation in the nature of indian politics in the nature of nationalist mobilization now this however doesn't mean that the period that went before it was devoid of the kind of nationalist fervor that we come across the freedom fighters in the later decades we have in the close of the 19th century dedicated freedom fighters who were willing to sacrifice their lives by participating in militant nationalist movements some of them of course lost their track in acts of individual terror but the ideological commitment or the commitment of such men to india's freedom can never be doubted one of the main limitations of this earlier phase of nationalism as we have said was their failure to mobilize the masses so one of the main intentions of this discussion is to look a little more closely at the 19th century and the different strands of anti colonial resistance in the course of the 19th century before modern politics had emerged in the last quarter of the 19th century in this regard we can actually talk about the rise of the nationalist public sphere from 1860s onwards as an important turn around in indian politics associations began to emerge initially at the provincial level then the experiments at the provincial level contributed to the emergence of the congress in 1885 looked upon by historians as the rise of the politics of national unity and along with associations you have the print media which became very important with the proliferation of vernacular newspapers the vernacular newspapers began to relay downwards to the popular level i nationalist ideas which were current or which were discussed at the higher echelons of intellectual life things were which were discussed at the level of associations among leaders of the associations among leaders of the congress could easily percolate downwards to the local level through the vernacular newspapers reporting on the congress and the kind of agenda that the congress had set out for indians i mean the representation the question of representation for example began to figure very prominently as one of the main issues on which early congressmen concentrated the drain of wealth was another such question deindustrialization of the indian economy the failure of the colonial state to create conditions for india's economic growth india's industrialization the refusal of the colonial state to protect local industries so all of these issues began to be debated and the debates the information the content of the nationalist arguments began to percolate downwards to the lower levels to the small towns to even to the rural areas through the wider circulation of the vernacular newspapers that it was not just a whimsical act on the part of lord lytton 
to enact that famous or infamous legislation, the Vernacular Press Act, which almost synchronized with the prohibition that Lytton also imposed on dramatic performances. So nationalism had already begun to emerge in the, uh, as a powerful political force in India in the 1870s or 1880s. Anti-colonial resistance was not only the monopoly of the modern nationalists. The modern nationalists were using the language of politics that they had imbibed or they had learned from British philosophy through their exposure to Western political ideals, through English education. It was from the English educated intelligentsia that the modern uh, nationalist uh, intelligentsia emerged. It was through their engagement with Western political thought that they espoused nationalism as a legitimate political ideal for the Indians to achieve a status of equality with the West. But even before that, there were traditional resistance movements. Sir, uh, what is the nature of these traditional resistance movements and how are they different from the modern nationalism? That's right. The character of modern nationalism can be well understood, which is that you have an organization, you have a certain continuity, you have petitions drafted by the organizations, you have meetings, you have pamphlets which are circulating, you have political treatises through which the views of different political groups were articulated. Traditional resistance movements actually did not follow this kind of organizational framework of model politics. Many of these movements came and went. They came in cycles. Some of these certainly acquired a good deal of intensity. Some of these became widespread but the kind of continuity that you come across in modern politics, organizational politics, dependent entirely on the kind of organizational continuity that associations were able to provide, traditional resistance movements didn't have this kind of continuity. It doesn't mean that the traditional resistance movements were only a few sporadic incidents. They happened quite regularly, but they happened at different points of time, at different locations. Then what was this traditional resistance movement all about? And how does one define it in order to distinguish it from modern politics? One kind of distinction that I have just said, but one might actually borrow certain phrases which had been used by anthropologists or historians, phrases like primary resistance, phrases like secondary resistance, Primary resistance would imply a certain kind of resistance which was usual in most societies at the very early stage of colonial intervention, when the indigenous landowning classes would make a common cause with the peasantry or with the rural classes against the various kinds of interventions that colonial rule brought about in rural society. A man, a historian of great eminence, Eric Stokes, who had started basically as a historian of Africa, used this particular phraseology in order to understand the revolt of 1857, for example, arguing that this was a traditional resistance movement in which the landowning classes, the peasants, and the aristocracy, the Mughal aristocracy in the region which had felt threatened by the British, all of them made a common cause against the British. They were joined by the sepoys, according to Eric Stokes, were actually peasants in uniform. But 1857, as you can uh, realize, was the climax of many such movements that had already begun since the very early part of colonial intervention. You can trace the history of such resistance movements from the late 18th century. If you look at Western Bengal, you see many such occurrences. Chuar uprising is one of them because it is most prominent. But you have many localized resistance movements in which the local landowners were actually trying to mobilize their dependent peasantry, especially their armed retinue, in movement of resistance against colonialism. Pike Rebellion in Orissa, for example, early in the 19th century, can be cited as another such instance 
where the pikes, the military retinue of the local chiefs, participated in a combined resistance along with their masters against the British. One reason for this is that the chiefs or the zamidars had felt threatened by the kind of encroachments that the British were making into their customary rights through these new policies. Some of the privileges that they had enjoyed in the past were abolished. The pikes felt threatened because the rent-free privilege that they had enjoyed for their services to the chiefs by way of what was known as pike on land were brought within the orbit of taxation. So once the privileges of many of these traditional classes, the zamidars and the retinue, were threatened by the colonial revenue policies attempt to maximize revenue income by destroying privileges, the rebellion took the character of a kind of combined resistance. So instances of such kinds where you can see a certain combination of different classes in the rural society, the zamidars, the peasants, the armed retinue, were endemic since the early part of colonial rule. It is often argued that the revolt of 1857 was a climax of this process of early resistance, which can be labeled differently. You may use traditional resistance movement uh, as a convenient label. You can use your own labels. Labels actually do not matter much. What is implied is that you have such instances of rebellions where many of the rural classes, despite their different status or differences, despite their mutual hostilities over economic or social issues, were able to come together in movements of combined resistance against the British or against the Firangi, particularly when you see that in 1857 all of these different classes were falling in line and fighting the British. You have the Mughal emperor on the one hand, you have the local aristocracy which includes the rulers of Awadh, some of the 18th century aristocrats, some peasant leaders, some sepoys, disgruntled soldiers of the army, all of these were actually coming together in a massive upsurge against British rule. S.B. Chaudhary, for example, talks about this continuous tradition of civil resistance throughout the early part of the 19th century in his famous book, Civil Disturbances. You have disagreements among historians about the nature of the mutiny about which you are certainly familiar. R.C. Majumdar would be inclined to describe it as a mere sepoy mutiny, while S.N. Sen would actually try to blend the activities of the mutinous sepoys with the kind of civil disturbances that Chaudhary was talking about. Then you have Stokes, who sees how the different classes were falling in line together against the British. You have Rudrangshu Mukherjee's Awadhin Revolt, in which Rudrangshu Mukherjee tries to establish the argument that the intensity of the local resistance in Awadh was largely due to the kind of combination that could be forged between the Awadh Talukdars and the peasants. So considering all these features, some people are inclined to label 1857 as a kind of a proto-nationalist movement. Sir, what is this proto-nationalism all about, which one find in the revolt of 1857? One simple answer is that you have uh, a certain combination of different classes of people in Indian society who found colonial rule or the rule of the foreigner as morally unacceptable. But a more important dimension of this should be the kind of modern political message which many of the proclamations also carried. Most of the proclamations were actually talking about the way the Firangi was trying to denationalize them or were trying to impose foreign religion on them, infidel religion on them. The Firangis were looked upon as a threat to traditional customs and religion. You are all familiar with the Sepoy grievances about overseas service. This was looked upon as a deliberate attempt by the Firangi to attack their religion. Kalapani was not acceptable. On the other hand, the greased cartridge controversy also demonstrates the kind of social conservatism, certain attachment to traditional mores and a certain suspicion about the intentions of the foreign rulers 
was also endemic in the minds of the sepoys who shared with the traditional Indian society the natural resentment about the kind of intervention that the colonial rulers were making in Indian social customs. That is one level. But more importantly, if you study the proclamations of the rebels in 1857, apart from using the authority of the Mughal Empire as the symbolic authority of the United India, so the name of the Mughal Emperor was invoked as a kind of a central rallying point for all classes of people, asking them to follow the lead of the emperor who had joined the rebellion. Some of the proclamations were not so conservative in tone or were not merely talking about the threat to religion. Some of these proclamations were talking about the utter illegitimacy of British rule because the British were depriving Indian people of their legitimate income. It had become uh, oppressive of the peasants, it had destroyed industries, it had deprived the literate classes of the legitimate sources of employment that they had enjoyed under Mughal rule. The British rule by importing large quantities of machine-made textiles were depriving the artisans of their livelihood. So you have the anticipation of what we call modern economic nationalism in some of these proclamations. So if you consider these proclamations, you can get a sense of why some historians would be inclined to label it as a kind of a proto-nationalist movement which anticipated some of the features of modern nationalism without, of course, the organization, without, of course, the decisively secular intonation that we come across in modern nationalism. The point is that in the latter half of the 19th century, such instances of rebellion became less visible. Such instances of rebellion in which different classes were coming together became less visible and pure peasant movements became more recurrent. Now I'm using the term pure peasant movement deliberately in order to distinguish the kind of rural resistance that continued to take place in India in the latter half of the century, discarding to some extent the kind of combination of classes that you come across in the traditional resistance movement. In the pure peasant movements, you have different kinds of movements. Movements of the settled peasantry against the rental oppression by the Zamidars, movements of the peasantry against the moneylenders, the movements of the tribal peasantry who lived in the forest or regions close to the forest who resented the kind of infringement that the forest laws had made into their rights in forest, the common right that they had traditionally enjoyed in the past. So the peasant movements that became an recurrent in the second half of the 19th century were mainly directed against indigenous oppressors, but in the, in the process it was also directed against colonial rule. To say that these were mainly social movements without any political motivation is to minimize the importance of these movements. To say that these were merely social movements without any political impact is to minimize the kind of terror that the colonial state felt with the occurrence of such movements and the kind of mobilization of coercive forces that the colonial state made on behalf of the propertied classes. So all of these acts were political acts, contrary to some of the views we should look upon these merely as social movements since these were not movements of modern kinds or since these were not connected with modern nationalism. But one should imagine that similar kinds of grievances when they became co-opted by nationalism in the 1920s would become a part of the nationalist struggle against British rule because eventually the nationalists would interpret freedom in a larger sense offering emancipatory promises to peasants from the kind of oppression that they were suffering in the hands of the Rothiers or the usurious moneylenders. So if you look at the history of Bengal in the latter half of the 19th century, there were a frequent rent disturbances. And around the middle of the 1870s, one of these disturbances acquired a more organized shape when some of the rich peasants, armed with the Rent Act of 1859, which gave them a certain stable right in land, 
wanted to register their right of occupancy and by refusing to pay enhanced rent or in other words the ceiling on rental rate that the act of 1859 created was linked with the proof that the peasants could establish for continued occupancy for 12 years. So there are such local factors as well. I mean, in the case of a movement, a peasant movement around the middle of 1870s in Bengal, defending occupancy status became one of the main objectives of the peasant leaders. But in the backdrop of a continuous history of rent disturbances, Similarly, moneylenders were also targets of attack. You have moneylenders in the Deccan who were attacked by the peasants whose land had begun to be taken over by the usurers when they realized that the peasants were no longer going to earn enough income in order to be able to repay their loans with the cotton slump. During the cotton boom in the 1860s, when supply of raw cotton from the United States to England had been suspended temporarily, and Indian cotton was in high in demand, in cotton growers in Maharashtra began to produce cotton on a large scale. Cultivation of cotton required enough investment. They borrowed heavily. They saw a period of prosperity, but suddenly the period of prosperity was cut short by the resumption of supply from the United States in which situation the land of the peasants began to pass into the hands of the moneylenders who grabbed their land on the strength of court decrees. So that was the occasion when there were movements against moneylenders. But movements against moneylenders were taking place all over India. Yeah, but the Deccan riots around the middle of 1870s acquired a greater prominence. So this is just another type of resistance. You will find the tribal resistance as another instance uh, where cultural revitalization of the tribe was an equally important concern along with uh, restoration of their land. Sir, uh, what is this cultural revitalization? In the tribal movements actually we see this feature which distinguishes many of the tribal movements from the movements of the settled peasantry. In the case of the latter, you have a clear agenda set out in terms of clear economic demands. I mean, the attack on the moneylenders or attack on the rotiers uh, were all motivated by pure material concerns. In the case of the tribals, you have this revitalization aspect, which is that for the tribes, the land that they held was not merely a productive resource, but a kind of a part of patrimony that they had inherited from their ancestors. The land was associated with their collective memory. Once they were thrown out of this land and they had to migrate to other regions in search of livelihood, they saw it as a kind of a threat to their existence. And when such threats came, there was a tendency among all of these tribes to undergo a kind of purification movement as a self-strengthening measure. And such revitalization took on different forms in different places. But in the case of the Mundas, for example, we know the case of Birsa's leadership. Birsa asked his followers to adopt certain Vaishnava rituals as a kind of a purificatory measure in order that the tribe's strength would be reinforced by this process of puritanism or this process of purification so that with additional strength, they would be able to take on the power of the foreigners or the power of the oppressors or the outsider oppressors they would be able to restore their land to themselves and also to restore the Mundaraj. So cultural revitalization in the case of the tribal movements certainly constituted one important dimension. But when we talk about the movements of the settled peasantry, there are instances of how in situations where the landowners or the exploiting classes and the peasantry belong to two different religions, or belong to two different ethnic groups, the movement of the peasantry against their oppressors, moneylenders or rotiers or landowners, whoever they were, these movements or the, their animosity towards their oppressors could take on the character of a kind of communal mobilization or an ethnic mobilization, ethnic riot. For example, one historian of the Deccan riots is inclined to argue 
that the Deccan riots was more an ethnic riot than a consequence of a redistribution of social power in Maratha countryside. Now, one traditional argument was that since the peasants were losing land to moneylenders, they felt aggrieved with the gradual passage of control over land to the moneylenders. Neil Charles Stewart says that it was an ethnic riot, that the local peasants actually spared the local moneylenders. Their main targets of attack were the moneylenders of Gujarati origin who came from the towns, so, so they became the target of attack. You can see similar things also happening in the Mopla unrest, which is a continuous history from 1836 onwards. It is suggested that in their case, a kind of religious fanaticism acted as a motive force, especially in a condition where the Janmis, predominantly Nambudiri Brahmin landholding communities, also became targets of attack along with the colonial state. So there may be situations where demographic factors or particular ethnic configurations would turn a movement arising from class conflict into ethnic riots or communal conflicts. One important exception, the Indigo Rebellion in Bengal. So why is this Indigo Rebellion an exception? Because this is one rebellion where you can see the anticipation of the kind of building of bridges between the urban world, between the politics of the urban intelligentsia and the peasantry. Something for which we actually celebrate the rise of Gandhi. It was to start with a movement of the peasants. Many of them were rich peasants who had been producing indigo, but who refused to produce indigo when indigo was unremunerative, but were forced by the planters to do it because these people had already become indebted to the planters by taking huge amount of advances. So that was one layer of conflict. There was another layer of conflict where the local landlords, once the planters after 1836-37 became keen to buy land in order to be able to control the reluctant peasantry to force them to produce indigo, they wished to become a landholding interest as well. So the indigenous landholders were scared by the presence of these planters and they began to join hands with the peasantry and the local level. Now the intelligentsia, the small town lawyers, started pleading their case in the courts of law. You have the newspapers reporting the oppression by the planters in horrifying terms. The great Harishchandra Mukherjee of Hindu Patriot was reporting fairly consistently about the inequities of the plantation system. So things which became associated with modern nationalism, we find in the Indigo Rebellion. So this is the reason why I consider the Indigo Rebellion to be an exception. But then this is our point of entry, as we sum up this part of the discussion, to the things that would come later, that would come in the age of high nationalism from 1920s onwards, with the rise of Gandhi, with the rise of a new generation of leaders, with the inclusion of hitherto submerged regions of India within the orbit of nationalism.